Book Four, Chapter One of Les Miserables, translated by Isabel F. Hapgood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Melissa. Les Miserables by Victor Hugo. Book Fourth. To confide is sometimes to deliver into a person's power. Chapter One. One mother meets another mother. There was at Montfermeil, near Paris, during the first quarter of their century, a sort of cook shop which no longer exists. This cook shop was kept by some people named Thénardier, husband and wife. It was situated in Boulanger Lane. Over the door there was a board nailed flat against the wall. Upon this board was painted something which resembled a man carrying another man on his back the latter wearing the big gilt epaulets of a general, with large silver stars. Red spots represented blood, the rest of the picture consisted of smoke, and probably represented a battle. Below ran this inscription, At the sign of Sergeant of Waterloo, Au Sergeant de Waterloo. Nothing is more common than a cart or a truck at the door of a hostelry. Nevertheless, the vehicle, or to speak more accurately, the fragment of a vehicle, which encumbered the street in front of the cook-shop of the sergeant of Waterloo, one evening at the spring of 1818, would certainly have attracted by its mass the attention of any painter who had passed that way. It was the forecarriage of one of those trucks which are used in wooded tracts of country, and which serve to transport thick planks in the trunks of trees. This forecarriage was composed of a massive iron axle-tree with a pivot, into which was fitted a heavy shaft, and which was supported by two huge wheels. The whole thing was compact, overwhelming, and misshapen. It seemed like the gun-carriage of an enormous cannon. The ruts of the road had bestowed on the wheels, the fellies, the hub, the axle, and the shaft, a layer of mud, a hideous yellowish daubing hue, tolerably like that with which people are fond of ornamenting cathedrals. The wood was disappearing under mud, and the iron beneath rust. Under the axle-tree hung, like drapery, a huge chain, worthy of some Goliath of a convict. This chain suggested not the beams, which it was its office to transport, but the mastodons and mammoths which it might have served to harness. It had the air of the galleys, but of cyclopean and superhuman galleys, and it seemed to have been detached from some monster. Homer would have bound Polyphemus with it, and Shakespeare, Taliban. Why was that forecarriage of a truck in that place in the street? In the first place, to encumber the street, next in order that it might finish the process of rusting there is a throng of institutions in the old social order which one comes across in this fashion as one walks about outdoors and which have no other reasons for existence than the above the centre of the chain swung very near the ground in the middle and in the loop as in the rope of a swing there were seated and grouped on that particular evening in exquisite interlacement two little girls one about two and a half years old the other eighteen months the younger in the arms of the other. A handkerchief, cleverly knotted about them, prevented their falling out. A mother had caught sight of that frightful chain and had said, Come, there's a plaything for my children. The two children, who were dressed prettily and with some elegance, were radiant with pleasure. One would have said that they were two roses at mid-old iron. Their eyes were a triumph. Their fresh cheeks were full of laughter. One had chestnut hair, the other brown. Their innocent faces were two delighted surprises. A blossoming shrub which grew near wafted to the passers-by perfumes, which seemed to emanate from them. The child of eighteen months displayed her pretty little bare stomach with the chaste indecency of childhood. Above and around these two delicate heads, all made of happiness and steeped in light, a giant forecarriage, black with rust, almost terrible, all entangled in curves and wild angles, rose in a vault like the entrance of a cavern. A few paces apart, crouching down upon the threshold of the hostelry, the mother, not a very prepossessing woman, by the way, though touching at that moment, was swinging the two children by means of a long cord, watching them carefully for fear of accidents, with that animal and celestial expression which is peculiar to maternity. At every backward and forward swing the hideous links emitted a strident sound which resembled a cry of rage. The little girls were in ecstasies. The setting sun mingled in this joy, and nothing could be more charming than this caprice of chance which had made a chain of titans the swing of cherubim. As she rocked her little ones, the mother hummed in a discordant voice a romance then celebrated. 
"'It must be,' said the warrior. "'Her song and the contemplation of her daughters "'prevented her hearing and seeing what was going on in the street. "'In the meantime, someone had approached her "'as she was beginning the first couplet of the romance, "'and suddenly she heard a voice saying very near her ear, "'You have two beautiful children there, at madame. "'To the fair and tender Imogene,' replied the mother, "'continuing her romance. "'Then she turned her head. "'A woman stood before her, a few paces distant. "'This woman also had a child, which she carried in her arms. "'She was carrying, in addition, a large carpet-bag, "'which seemed very heavy. "'This woman's child was one of the most divine creatures "'that it was possible to behold. "'It was a girl, two or three years of age.' She could have entered into competition with the other two little ones, so far as the coquetry of her dress was concerned. She wore a cap of fine linen, ribbons on her bodice, and Valsienne lace in her cap. The folds of her skirt were raised so as to permit a view of her white, firm, and dimpled leg. She was admirably rosy and healthy. The little beauty inspired a desire to take a bite from the apples of her cheeks. Of her eyes nothing could be known, except that they must be very large, and that they had magnificent lashes. She was asleep. She slept with that slumber of absolute confidence peculiar to her age. The arms of mothers are made of tenderness. In them, children sleep profoundly. As for the mother, her appearance was sad and poverty-stricken. She was dressed like a working woman who is inclined to turn into a peasant again. She was young. Was she handsome? Perhaps, but in that attire it was not apparent. Her hair, a golden lock of which had escaped, seemed very thick but it was severely concealed beneath an ugly, tight, close, nun-like cap tied under the chin. A smile displays beautiful teeth when one has them, but she did not smile. Her eyes did not seem to have been dry for a very long time. She was pale. She had a very weary and rather sickly appearance. She gazed upon her daughter asleep in her arms with the air peculiar to a mother who has nursed her own child. A large blue handkerchief, such as the invalide use, was folded into a fichu, and concealed her figure clumsily. Her hands were sunburnt and all dotted with freckles. Her forefinger was hardened and lacerated with a needle. She wore a cloak of coarse brown woolen stuff, a linen gown, and coarse shoes. It was Fantine. It was Fantine, but difficult to recognize. Nevertheless, on scrutinizing her attentively, it was evident that she still retained her beauty. A melancholy fold, which resembled the beginning of irony, wrinkled her right cheek. As for her toilette, that aerial toilette of muslin and ribbons, which seemed made of mirth, of folly, and of music, full of bells and perfumed with lilacs, had vanished like that beautiful and dazzling hoar-frost which is mistaken for diamonds in the sunlight. It melts and leaves the branch quite black. Ten months had elapsed since the pretty farce. What had taken place during those ten months? It can be divined. After abandonment, strange circumstances— Fantine had immediately lost sight of Favorite, Zephine, and Dahlia. The bond once broken on the side of the men, it was loosened between the women. It would have been greatly astonished had any one of them told them a fortnight later that they had been friends. There no longer existed any reason for such a thing. Fantine had remained alone, the father of her child gone. Alas, such ruptures are irrevocable. She found herself absolutely isolated, minus the habit of work, and plus the taste for pleasure. Drawn away by her liaison with Tholomais, to disdain the pretty trade which she knew, she had neglected to keep her market open. It was now closed to her. She had no resource. Fantine barely knew how to read, and did not know how to write. In her childhood she had only been taught to sign her name. She had a public letter writer indict an epistle to Tholomais, then a second, then a third. Tholomais replied to none of them. Fantine heard the gossip say as they looked at her child, "'Who takes those children seriously? One only shrugs one's shoulders over such children.' Then she thought of Tholomais, who had shrugged his shoulders over his child, and who did not take that innocent being seriously, and her heart grew gloomy toward that man. But what was she to do? She no longer knew to whom to apply. She had committed a fault, but the foundation of her nature, as will be remembered, was modesty and virtue. She was vaguely conscious that she was on the verge of falling into distress and of gliding into a worse state. Courage was necessary. She possessed it and held herself firm. The idea of returning to her native town of Montreux-sur-Mer occurred to her. There someone might possibly know her and give her work. Yes, but it would be necessary to conceal her fault. 
in a confused way she perceived the necessity of a separation which would be more painful than the first one her heart contracted but she took her resolution fantine as we shall see had the fierce bravery of life she had already valiantly renounced finery had dressed herself in linen and had put all her silks all her ornaments all her ribbons and all her laces on her daughter the only vanity which was left to her and a holy one it was she sold all that she had which produced for her two hundred francs her little debts paid she had only about eighty francs left at the age of twenty-two on a beautiful spring morning she quitted paris bearing her child on her back any one who had seen these two pass would have had pity on them this woman had in all the world nothing but her child and the child had in all the world no one but this woman. Fantine had nursed her child, and this had tired her chest, and she coughed a little. We shall have no further occasion to speak of Monsieur Félix Tholomès. Let us confine ourselves to saying that twenty years later, under King Louis-Philippe, he was a great provincial lawyer, wealthy, influential, a wise elector, and a very severe juryman. He was still a man of pleasure." Towards the middle of the day, after having, from time to time, for the sake of resting herself, travelled for three or four sous a league in what was then known as the Petite Voiture des Environs de Paris, the little suburban coach service, Fantine found herself at Montfermeil, in the alley of Boulanger. As she passed the Thénardier hostelry, the two little girls, blissful in the monster swing, had dazzled her in a manner, and she had halted in front of that vision of joy. Charms exist. These two little girls were a charm to this mother. She gazed at them in much emotion. The presence of angels is an announcement of paradise. She thought that, above the sin, she beheld the mysterious here of providence. These two little creatures were evidently happy. She gazed at them, she admired them, in such emotion that at the moment when their mother was recovering her breath between two couplets of her song, she could not refrain from addressing to her the remark which we have just read. "'You have two pretty children, madame.' "'The most ferocious creatures are disarmed by caresses bestowed on their young.' "'The mother raised her head and thanked her, "'and bade the wayfarer sit down on the bench at the door, "'she herself being seated on the threshold. "'The two women began to chat. "'My name is Madame Thénardier, said the mother of the two little girls. "'We keep this in.' "'Then, her mind still running on her romance, "'she continued humming between her teeth. It must be so, I am a knight, and I am off to Palestine. This Madame Thénardier was a sandy-complexioned woman, thin and angular, the type of the soldier's wife in all of its unpleasantness, and what was odd, with a languishing air which she owed to her perusal of romances. She was a simpering but masculine creature. Old romances produced that effect when rubbed against the imagination of cook-shop women. She was still young, she was barely thirty, if this crouching woman had stood upright, her lofty stature and her frame of, of an arambulating colossus suitable for fairs might have frightened the traveller at the outset, troubled her confidence, and disturbed what caused what we have to relate to vanish. A person who is seated instead of standing erect, destinies hang upon such a thing as that. The traveller told her story with slight modifications, that she was a working woman, that her husband was dead, that her work in Paris had failed her, and that she was on her way to seek it elsewhere, in her own native parts that she had left Paris that morning on foot, that as she was carrying her child and felt fatigued, she had got into the Villemobile coach when she had met it, that from Villemobile she had come to Montfermeil on foot, that the little one had walked a little, but not much, because she was so young, and that she had been obliged to take her up, and the jewel had fallen asleep. At this word she bestowed on her daughter a passionate kiss, which woke her. The child opened her eyes, great blue eyes like her mother's, and looked at, what? Nothing with that serious and sometimes severe air of little children, which is a mystery of their luminous innocence in the presence of our twilight of virtue. One would say that they feel themselves to be angels, and that they know us to be men. Then the child began to laugh, and although the mother held fast to her, she slipped to the ground with the unconquerable energy of a little being which wished to run. All at once she caught sight of the two others in the swing, stopped short, and put out her tongue in sign of admiration. Mother Thénardier released her daughters, made them descend from the swing, and said, "'Now amuse yourselves, all three of you.' Children become acquainted quickly at that age, and at the expiration of the minute the little Thénardier were playing with a newcomer and making holes in the dirt, which was an immense pleasure. The newcomer was very gay. The goodness of the mother was written in the gaiety of the child. 
she had seized a scrap of wood which served for a shovel and energetically dug a cavity big enough for a fly the gravedigger's business becomes a subject for laughter when performed by a child the two women pursued their chat what is your little one's name cosette for cosette read euphrasie the child's name was euphrasie but out of euphrasie the mother had made cosette by that sweet and graceful instinct of mothers and of the populace which changes josepha into pepita and francoise into Celette. it is a sort of derivative which disarranges and disconcerts the whole science of etymologies we have known a grandmother who succeeded in turning theodore into non how old is she she's going on three that's the age of my eldest in the meantime the three little girls were grouped in an attitude of profound anxiety and blissfulness an event had happened a big worm had emerged from the ground and they were afraid and they were in ecstasies over it their radiant brows touched each other one would have said that there were three hoods and one aureole how easily children get acquainted at once exclaimed my the thenardier one would swear that they were three sisters this remark was probably the spark which the other mother had been waiting for she seized the thenardier's hand looked at her fixedly and said will you keep my child for me the thenardier made one of those movements of surprise which signify neither assent nor refusal cosette's mother continued you see i cannot take my daughter to the country my work will not permit it with a child one can find no situation people are ridiculous in the country it was the good god who caused me to pass your inn when i caught sight of your little one so pretty so clean and so happy it overwhelmed me i said here is a good mother that is just the thing they will make three sisters and then it will not be long before i return will you keep my child for me i must see about it replied the thenardier i will give you six francs a month here a man's voice called from the depths of the cook-shop not for less than seven francs and six months paid in advance six times seven makes forty-two said the thenardier i will give it said the mother and fifteen francs in addition for preliminary expenses added the man's voice total fifty-seven francs said madame thenardier and she hummed vaguely with these figures it must be said the warrior i will pay it said the mother i have eighty francs i shall have enough left to reach the country by travelling on foot i shall earn money there and as soon as i have a little i will return for my darling the man's voice resumed the little one has an outfit that is my husband said the thenardier of course she has an outfit the poor treasure i understood perfectly that it was your husband and a beautiful outfit too a senseless outfit everything by the dozen and silk gowns like a lady it is here in my carpet bag you must hand it over struck in the man's voice again of course i shall give it to you said the mother it would be very queer if i were to leave my daughter quite naked the master's face appeared that's good he said the bargain was concluded the mother passed the night at the inn gave up her money and left her child fastened her carpet bag once more now reduced in volume by the removal of the outfit and light henceforth and set out on the following morning intending to return soon people arrange such departures tranquilly but they are despairs a neighbor of the Thénardier met this mother as she was setting out, and came back with a remark, "'I have just seen a woman crying in the street, so that it was enough to rend your heart.' When Cosette's mother had taken her departure, the man said to the woman, "'That will serve to pay my note for one hundred and ten francs, which falls due to-morrow. I lacked fifty francs. Do you know that I should have had a bailiff and a protest after me? You played in the mousetrap nicely with your young ones.' "'Without suspecting it,' said the woman. End of Book 4, Chapter 1, Recording by Melissa.